So thank you everyone for coming. Um, this software is a uh, free soft. This session is free software and you. The software is free too. <laughs> yeah, the software is free. The session is free. Well, okay, the session's not free. Uh, my name is Larry Garfields. Uh, I'm a developer with Palantir.net, and this is Peter Rolanin. Uh, Peter, introduction. Uh, I'm on the engineering team with Acquia, and. And Peter waylaid me into uh, doing this presentation with him since uh, I'm also on the board of directors for the Drupal Association dealing with legal matters. Uh, neither of us is an attorney. We just talk about it a lot. So we'll put that caveat out there to start with. Um, before we actually get started, let's have a just quick poll here. Who here considers themselves primarily a developer? OK. Who here is uh, a, f a consultant of some kind, freelance consultant? Who here owns their own consulting shop? of some kind, who works for a large company that happens to use Drupal internally. So what do the rest of you do? <laughs> I think we hit everyone at least once. Yeah, OK. <clears throat> uh, so free software, what are we talking about? So let's set the Wayback Machine for 1960s. Uh, computers are still you know, big, honking piles of expensive metal. Uh, and any software on them pretty much has to be compiled for that machine. Uh, if you have to provide software to someone else, you're providing them with source code for it because it doesn't work otherwise. And they usually have to modify it to get it to work on a new piece of hardware anyway. So in a sense, all software is freely distributed because there's no value in it. The value's in the hardware. And <clears throat> it doesn't occur to people to charge separately for the software because, well, it's useless without the hardware anyway. That began to change in the late 60s, early 70s, as you started to have computers that could run software that wasn't custom compiled for that particular box. <coughs> and you qu quickly had a business model spring up of selling software licenses and, and selling software as if it were a product. And this got kind of popular, um, but also annoyed an awful lot of people, especially people from academia who were used to the idea of just sharing information. Um, and one of the people that this really annoyed is a man named Richard Stallman, who at the time in the early 80s worked at MIT in uh, the United States. And uh, famous story, he had a problem with his printer driver. And as any good geek, uh, dug into the code and figured out the problem and f made a fix for it and sent a patch back to the company and said, I found a bug. Here's a fix for it. And they said, great, thanks. Please sign this 10-page document saying that you will not tell anyone about this bug and you will assign all copyright over to us. And he said, what? I, well, you know, why would I have to do that? Well, how else are people going to get the code unless we give it to them and you've given us complete license to do so? And he said, well, screw that. I'll give it to them and you, know, you can go away. And uh, being a stubborn person, uh, <laughs> he started the GNU's Not Unix project, or GNU. Uh, GNU being the world's first recursive acronym because Stallman has a very weird sense of humor. <laughs> Basic idea being, at this point, most Unix-like operating systems were proprietary, expensive, closed source, um, you know, all those things that he didn't like. <coughs> and so he founded the Free Software Foundation in 1985 with the express purpose of creating a completely free operating system uh, from the ground up called GNU. Now, when we say free, we're talking about uh, free as in speech, not free as in beer. Not that there's anything wrong with free beer, mind you. Most of us rather like it. Um, but free in this case, we're talking about liberty. In non-English languages, free is usually translated as uh, libre or libre, uh, you know, whatever language you're translating into. <coughs> um, and when we say free here, we specifically are talking about these four criteria that the Free Software Foundation considers to be the definition of free, in this case, for freedom. Uh, there's freedom zero, because geeks start counting at zero, which is the freedom to just run a program for any purpose. Whatever that purpose is, whether the person who wrote the code morally approves of it or not, it, you get to run the program to do whatever it is you're going to do. Uh, freedom one, the freedom to study the program and change it to suit your needs. The freedom to share copies with others to help your friends. And the freedom to improve it 
<coughs> and to share those improvements with others as well so that everyone benefits. Not just you, not just the original developer, but everyone benefits. And I usually like to re-summarize these four freedoms as the freedom to use, learn, improve, and share. These are all really nice concepts. You know, you do what you want with this software, let yourself learn, you know, make the world a better place, share with your friends. You know, this is what we tell our children is the, the correct moral way to behave, is share your toys. And free software is based on that same concept. It's morally correct to share your toys. <coughs> And uh, to this end, the Free Software Foundation published the GNU General Public License, which is a software license that, when you strip away the legalese, basically says, here's this code. You have these four freedoms from me on condition that if you redistribute it to someone else, if you share it to someone else, you give them the same freedoms. And that includes if you have a modified version with cool new features, you share those features with them too. So it's a share-alike license, and that's basically the concept behind free software. <coughs> and okay, the Free Software Foundation and a team of developers started working on this completely free operating system. And by 1990 or so, they had almost everything you need for an operating system except for a kernel, which handles the actual device drivers. They said, okay, we're almost there. Let's start working on a kernel. And then in 1991, some Finnish student uh, dumped a Unix-like kernel on the internet and said, hi, I've got this little toy project that probably won't go anywhere, but I thought it was fun to write. And people said, hey, this thing is great. Now, if only you had the rest of the stuff to put on top of a kernel. Hey, look, here's this cool stuff that you can put on top of a kernel that the GNU project has written. So now we've got this great working Linux operating system. And the Free Software Foundation said, no, 90% of this code we wrote, it's GNU. And so you'll find a lot of people who will say, you know, no, it's GNU Linux versus Linux. Uh, they lost that fight, just you call it Linux. <coughs> so. And, and we, we might... It's working? Yeah. It is? It should be. Okay. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, uh, one thing, if you look today, the GNU project still has a kernel uh, underway <laughs> <laughs> called GNU Herd, which has, yeah. has yet to actually... They've been writing be, it since about 1990. Right. It doesn't work yet. <laughs> Um, so, you know, they had this Linux or GNU Linux operating system <coughs> uh, and application software on top of it that was all distributed for free um, and, you know, with, if, as freedom software. Um, and, but there's still other stuff to do with uh, that software and there's still money to be made there in services, in training, in consulting, um, and so forth. And there are companies that built a pretty decent business model around this. And over time, people observed, as in particular, a man named Eric Raymond <coughs> uh, in his uh, paper called The Cathedral and the Bazaar, that, you know what, this share-alike philosophy on software, it works really well for making good code. Because when you're able to collaborate and share code, rather than wasting effort competing with each other and keeping things hidden, you get a better product out of it at the end. <coughs> at the same time, a lot of businesses were really turned off by this word free. And you can blame the English language for this completely. Uh, I, I'm saying this in England, so I'm not sure that <laughs> the joke would go over as well as it would in Copenhagen. Um, and yet the idea of free software turned off a lot of businesses. Well, free? For th I, I want to charge money. You know. <coughs> so they coined the term open source software um, to be, be more like a business-friendly marketing version of that. <laughs> and you know, the open source initiative, which is falling off the side of the screen here, I apologize for that. Um, <coughs> Uh, coined the term open source and defined it this way. There's, I think, 10 different points here for what something has to, you know, what a license has to be to qualify as open source. And these are, in fact, slightly different than free software. Uh, in particular, you can have an, something that is open source where you're allowed to distribute the original pr uh, code and your changes as a separate patch, but you're not allowed to combine them. That's legal under open source definition, not under free software. 99% of the time, something's going to be both, <coughs> um, but not always. Uh, for more information on this, opensource.org is the home of the uh, open source initiative, and I'm happy to say it's a Drupal site. And I'm not happy to say it's still running Garland. <laughs> but <coughs> open source is primarily a development model that makes better code. Free software is a philosophical model of sharing is the right thing to do. And of course, 
this pissed off the uh, free software people again because you know, if you're saying this is morally correct, then the fact that it produces better code is beside the point. Maybe it's true, maybe it's not, but that's beside the point. In practice, both are true in most cases, I would argue. <coughs> uh, and in the case of Drupal in particular, you get all of them. Drupal is developed in open source fashion. It is free software. It's under the GNU General Public License, or GPL. Uh, there's no cost for it, so it is free as in Drupal beer. We do, in fact, have our own Drupal beer. Uh, and free as in freedom. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Peter to talk a bit more about the you know, nitty-gritty details of um, you know, wh what you should know about free software licensing. So thanks, Larry. So that was kind of the history of um, uh, how these licenses developed, uh, where the free software movement came from. Uh, what I want to talk about was a little bit more of a practical approach. So if you're a developer, you're a consultant, you're a business owner, um, there's some things that, that you know, we've sort of struggled to communicate to people who use Drupal about what Drupal the Drupal license is, how Drupal should be used, how the code should be shared. And um, as we'll talk about that, you don't have to share the code is an important point. Um, the most important thing to sort of keep in mind as a broad uh, underlying principle is that all software licenses are based on copyright. So if you write code, generally you own the copyright or your employer owns the copyright. Um, and your permission to use the code um, derives from that copyright. It's a license from the copyright holder. And if you go and buy something like a Microsoft product, uh, some other commercial software to run on your machine, you'll see what you're actually buying is an end user license. You're not buying the software. You're buying a license to use the software on one computer or two computers or whatever the terms of the license are. Um, and that's important to keep in mind. It's important to keep in mind that as a developer. So speaking to other developers, um, if you're writing code and you want other people to be able to use your code, you need to apply a license to it. You need to apply a free software license so that other people can take your code, reuse it. Um, rather than being, if you don't apply any license, they can't use your code at all, legally. Um, and people often, when they hear this, say, well, you know what, I just want everyone to have it. I just want to give it away. I want it to be for the public. I don't, you know, don't want to think about licensing. Um, unfortunately, in the legal framework we live within, that doesn't work. There's no effective way uh, for you as an individual to dedicate a particular piece of code uh, to the public domain, to really give it away. It's, it's pretty hard. You have to probably have a lawyer help you with that. So instead, it's much, much easier and really the same thing um, in terms of the end effect. If you apply a very uh, liberal license to that code, a liberal open source or free software license to that code, that lets anyone who wants to, has a license to take the code, use it, change it, and give it to other people. That's what you want, right? So just again, if you're writing code, uh, make sure that you always include some kind of licensing statement with it so that people know what terms uh, they can use the code under. And I'll talk uh, in a minute about what some of those licensing options are. Um, but so we have uh, copyright <coughs> as the basis of all licenses. And one of the things that um, term that Stallman came up with is uh, sort of the basis of the GNU general public license is a term called copy left. <coughs> and this is where he had the insight that he could use the rights of the copyright system, and instead of enforcing restrictions on other people, he could use copyright to enforce freedoms. He uses co the GNU general public license is written so that it enforces sharing. You don't have any choice. You're only the only way you're allowed to use the software um, under the license from the copyright holder is if you also share it. With, if you share it, then you're giving the person you share it with the same freedoms. Stallman sometimes refers to it as a clever hack of the legal system that actually works pretty, well, pretty darn well. Right. So this, I mean, and there have been court cases testing the terms of the general public license and not extensively, but in general it is held up that this system of enforcing sharing uh, does work. And the cases where it's been challenged are things where mm -hmm. people, for example, have used Linux as a basis of like a set-top box. Right, and uh, if they forgot to give everyone the source code or didn't know they needed to or decided not to and they were taken to court and they had to go ahead and give everyone the source code uh, that ran on their set-top box, um, which was based on Linux. Um, so if you're a developer or a business owner or someone who's out looking at different software projects, not just Drupal, um, 
you will uh, typically run into uh, a bunch of different licenses. And really, the, the three that I, I want to talk about are the most common, uh, both that you'll encounter and that you might want to apply to your own code. Um, the first is the GNU General Public License, represented by the GNU, of course. Um, the uh, sometimes called the BSD license, more properly the modified BSD license, is a very simple license. Uh, this is used for, for example, the open BSD or free BSD uh, operating system. So that's their uh, little mascot there, the devil, uh, is the free BSD mascot. It, technically, it's a demon, as in a you know, background process on a computer. Again, open source people have a very bad sense of humor. Right. <laughs> And the third is the Feather, which is the symbol of the Apache Foundation, Apache Software Foundation. So Apache Software Foundation has a license um, that they apply to all their code. So for obviously you guys know the Apache web server. Um, so the code for the Apache web server is licensed under the Apache Software Foundation license, uh, actually version two. Um, and so all three of these licenses are basically free software licenses. They give you the rights to modify the code and redistribute it. Um, but they're not uh, only the general public license, the GNU one, um, is the only one of these three that's copy left. So that's the only one that says, if, if you receive the source code, you must give everyone else the source code when you distribute the software. Um, if you want something that's very close to public domain, you can use the modified BSD or something like that. And that's a, such a simple license, it basically just says, more or less, do what you want with this, um, and there's no warranty, don't sue me. That's basically what the BSD license says. Um, uh, if you're interested in finding out more about the philosophy, as Larry said, uh, there's sort of a philosophy of free software in addition to the practical implications. Um, I have a link here, so you can actually download uh, an entire book by Richard Stallman. And um, if you're interested in the sort of the philosoph philosophical underpinnings or how this movement developed, I'd recommend it. It's really a kind of fun reading just to see the thinking process that, that led uh, to this general public license, which is now really an important part of our lives, um, given that it's licensed for Linux, licensed for Drupal, licensed for a lot of the software that we use. Um, so again, um, because it's the only copyleft license, um, I would argue that the GPL is the only license that really preserves your freedom. Um, and the good news is that Drupal itself uses uh, the GNU general public license. Um, if you look at the FAQ that uh, Larry wrote with input from uh, Legal Minds, um, you'll see that uh, we say that you can use Drupal under version two or any later version of this general public license. Um, and that's actually has important implications. I don't want to go into them here. We can talk about them in the Q&A if, if people have questions. Um, but remember, so the GPL is a share alike license. Um, and one of the implications of that is that if you write um, a module or a theme, uh, the, the legal framework says that module or theme really depends on the Drupal core. It's, it's derived from the Drupal core, right? You're, if you wrote a module on its own, it doesn't do anything. If you wrote a theme on its own, it doesn't do anything. Therefore, it really has to integrate, has to be derived from a particular version of Drupal core. Um, and therefore, that code is covered by the same license as Drupal core which is the GNU general public license. Um, so you don't, if you write Drupal code, if you write a module or theme, you don't have any choice. This is important to be aware of. Uh, you have to uh, distribute, uh, have to license that code under the GPL. Um, now that might scare people. You're thinking, wait, um, you know, I'm writing this software for my site and I don't want to share it. Well, that's okay. Uh, the GPL only says if you share it, these are the terms, there is no requirement that you share uh, your code whatsoever. Uh, you can keep, you know, you can go off and you can write as many Drupal modules as you want, use them to run at any number of websites, and you don't have to share that code with anyone. Um, so you can keep your website code private. Um, that's well within, that's within your rights. Um, at Aqua, we certainly have projects where, you know, we have a few modules, custom special modules. We're not distributing those. Those are just, you know, for our in internal use um, and everything else uh, goes to the community. And in fact, you know, the more we share, and Larry will talk about this later, the more, you, the more we share, though, the more we benefit um, from the system where everyone else can see the code, everyone can help us fix the problems with it. Um, so really, while you can keep code private, uh, you should think about really 
it's to your benefit to share as much as you possibly can. One important point on sharing there, with PHP code or JavaScript, the source form and the usable form are the same thing. But if you're doing something in uh, C or Java or Flash, then there's a separate compiled version and a source version. What the GPL says is if you distribute the compiled version to someone, they have a right to the source version as well. Uh, <clears throat> so, and, and you have to tell them that they have, ac they have a right to that, they have access to the source version of the code. Doesn't matter in the case of PHP code because it's the same thing, but if you do work in other languages as well, that's an important thing to keep in mind, that if you distribute the compiled version, you have to distribute the source version as well. So um, one of the reasons that I wanted to, sure. You, right, you're Correct. not distributing the software. So there is a version of the GPL called the Afero General Public License. Um, and this is the license actually used by MongoDB um, by, yeah, and by CiviCRM and some other projects. And that has a clause that says if you put it uh, like on a public site, if it's accessible, then you have to share the code. Right, so that's that kind of... Um, closes what we would call the web service loophole. <laughs> so the GPL, uh, even in version 3, decided to maintain this web service loophole that you can run a public service with the code and you don't have to give people uh, the, the software. Yeah, but if I put my code on DO, then it must be GPL. Right. Yeah. But, you know, just because you have some custom module you wrote for a client site or for your site, um, the fact that someone visits your website does not count as them be getting, uh, having the code distributed to them. They're just visiting your service. Um, so, you know, what, in addition to, um, you know, wanting you to know about how Drupal is licensed, uh, you know, this is sort of a philosophical thing. As Larry said, it's, it's almost a moral question that, you know, to be a good community, to be a healthy community where we help each other. Um, we need to support sort of these values of freedom, of sharing. And part of that is that we need people to be aware <laughs> of actually what the GPL is and what those values are and how it works. And again, you know, just to sort of reemphasize, the GPL, even though it's a free software license, is actually somewhat restrictive. And it's more, it's more restrictive than the BSD license, more restrictive than the Apache license in the sense that you are required to share alike, um, you're not allowed to distribute the binary form without the source form. Um, so it's really freedom for the users, um, not so much for the developers, but for Drupal, we're all both, right? There's none of us that is a Drupal user and are a Drupal developer, not also a Drupal user. You're always uh, some combination of both. So for us, um, yeah, this is the, sort of the basis of, of our whole community, is our ability to share all this code so freely. Um, another sort of side note that I don't want to go into a lot of detail is that you should be aware in, in the broader uh, field of software, uh, there's a lot of sort of noise and concern and lawsuits uh, regarding software patents. Um, software patents can be a problem for you whether or not you use free software, whether you use, um, so basically anyone involved in developing a software product um, could be at risk of um, being sued for violating a software patent. Um, but using free software doesn't make that more likely. And in fact, the th version three of the GPL and the Apache uh, Software Foundation license version two have some clauses in them to try to penalize anyone who sues someone uh, building on open source software. Um, so. We can talk about that a little mo more later, or you can research it. Um, it's probably, n for most Drupal people, it's not that important. Uh, to, to clarify, it penalizes people who uh, make patent lawsuits against someone using free software if they're also using that code. It doesn't penalize someone just for using free software. Right. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Important it, it, attem it attempts to penalize the person initiating a, a patent lawsuit. Um, again, this is sort of, I think, rather untested um, in practice, but it's just worth being uh, aware of. Um, and there are other challenges to freedom, the uh, sort of free software freedom aside from software patents. Um, one of the sort of interesting ones, both from a sort of philosophical and technical standpoint, is the TiVo 
Uh, do people know about tivolization as a term? Um, so this was coined by Stallman. And um, he was very upset about this. So what TiVo did, um, and still does as far as I know, is that they use Linux as the basis of the TiVo. So they're distributing Linux. Um, and they distribute the source code of Linux with it, because they must. Um, but they also have a chip in the TiVo. And the chip checks um, signatures, digital signatures, basically hashes of all the software in the Linux uh, distribution. And if those don't match the thing that TiVo thinks it should match, it won't boot. So you have the source code. You can modify the source code. You can recompile it. But you can't actually run your modified version on the hardware because it has the chip <laughs> that prevents you from running a modified version. So this upset Richard Stallman very, very much, and he coined the term tivolization. Um, though he admitted that this was not violating the terms of the GPL. It's you know, kind of in a practical term, uh, taking away your freedom. But you know, in terms of the license he'd written, it was OK. So in version 3 of the GPL, uh, this is specifically prohibited. <laughs> um, yeah, so he fixed the bug. The, um, the practical effect of this has been very low, though, because very few projects have switched to GPL version 3. Uh, the Linux kernel is still GPL version 2 only. Um, and most of the you know, GNU software is still GPL 2. So well, you know, Stallman did fix the bug, it's this, this practice of tivolization is still you know, something you should be aware of. It, you can actually think of cases where this is useful. So if imagine this was not a TiVo for TV, um, but imagine this was a voting machine running software, right? And we don't want the voting machine to run modified software. Um, so the GPL3 actually ha includes a, a, a funny exclusion for this, that it's OK. It's still OK to do this if it's um, commercial hardware and not sold to private citizens, basically. Um, so that it, for exactly the case where you know, you're running a voting machine, you're running an air traffic control system, something where <laughs> it's really important that it's the right code, um, and it's like a commercial thing. Uh, um, but again, you know, so be aware that there are, there are ways. You know, the GPL is not sort of bulletproof in, er in every legal sense um, in terms of your freedoms, but is really the best tool um, that we have out there. And to sort of show you the flip side, so if we think about those other licenses I mentioned, the modified BSD and the Apache license, um, those aren't reciprocal licenses. So they don't enforce this share-alike principle on you or on people who ha use the software. And I've experienced this myself. So I have contributed a little bit to a, a open source software project that's licensed under the Apache Software Foundation license. Um, and you know, those weren't big improvements, but you know, OK, I'm happy to be a contributor to another project. And then I found that, OK, uh, you know, commercial company um, took a version of this software. Um, it's a Java project, as many of the Apache projects are. And they com you know, have a compiled version where they made some other enhancements that looked really interesting. They're like, wow, I'm like, this is a great feature. I want to know how it works. But I can't. Because it's under the Apache Software Foundation license. They have no requirement to distribute the source code. So I can get the software in the compiled form. I could you know, run it under a trial license, or I could pay for a commercial license. But there's no way for me to get the source code and see how that feature um, actually works, or use it for myself, even though I'm one of the contributors to the software that they're selling. Right, so that was very frustrating for me. And you know, again, I think as, as a developer, you know, think about where you want to invest your time. With Drupal, this is never going to happen to you. As Larry said, a little bit because it's PHP, it's hard. Uh, to make a closed version of PHP, but it's possible. There are, there are um, software that will make you know, obscured or compiled versions of PHP where you can't actually see the source. Um, that's not something anyone could ever do with Drupal. Um, and just a side note again, though, on, on business friendly, as Larry said, the open source movement is sort of a reaction to, to business community not understanding the implication of the word free in free software. Um, so this sort of ability to close source the product, uh, to sell it, um, even though it has you know, community contributors to it, is in, in many circles considered an advantage. Um, so the Apache Software Foundation says that this is why their license is actually better than the GPL. Because people can do this, they can make money off it by selling you a proprietary version. And that encourages them to contribute to the open source one. 
Uh, I don't really agree with that point of view, but you know, it's, it's worth being aware of that argument um, and why you know, that's, uh, that's sort of, a, a, again, a tension you might say between people who advocate free software versus people who advocate uh, open source software. Um, another point uh, you know, that's important for uh, both contractors, developers, business owners to think about is when you have some code written that you write um, or you have written on your behalf, who owns the copyright? That's a really important question because if you remember at the beginning I said licensing derives from the copyright. So if you don't, you have to know who owns the copyright in order to know who can license the software and who really has the right to distribute the software. Um, so if we're in the US, uh, the law is pretty clear that if you pay someone to write something for you, a novel or a piece of software, um, the person who paid owns the copyright. Um, in the EU, I'm, I'm not as clear on the situation. I think in some cases, you may actually retain the copyright even though someone else paid you to write the work. Um, so I would, if you're in the EU, you may know the answer to this question already. If you're not sure, I would, uh, you should investigate it. Um, if you're working though as a full-time employee, um, the copyright almost always belongs to the company you work for. Um, so the code that I write, the code that Ra Larry writes, uh, potentially you know, belongs to our employers. And this is, in terms of your Drupal <coughs> contribution, something to think about. Because it's not your willingness to contribute back to the community that matters. It's you may also ha have to convince your boss, your CEO, someone, that it's to the advantage of you, it's to the advantage of the company, it's to the advantage of the community uh, for the company to contribute uh, this code that's under their copyright um, you know, and once they contribute it, once they distribute it, it's automatically under the GPL. But they have the choice, as I said before, they could keep that, soft, that code in-house. There's no requirement that they send it out. And you as an employee don't necessarily have the right to share it because you don't own the copyright. Another thing to keep in mind there, at some companies, I think this is more common in the US than in Europe, um, code that you write uh, on your own time may or may not be owned by your employer depending on your employment contract. Check it. Um, I, I would personally recommend not signing a contract that gives your employer uh, ownership of code you write uh, on your own time, but some employment contracts do say that, so be aware of that and look into that. It's not really a copyright question, it's more of a contract law question, but uh, something to bear in mind. Um. So another thing to think about, you know, again, as a developer, as a contractor, as a business owner, is um, questions about, uh, you know, when you do a project, uh, who ends up owning the copyright, what is the license, how is the code uh, going to be distributed or not distributed at the end of that project. Um, so in particular, you should think about when you're signing contracts, um, does that contract specify who owns the copyright? So what I mentioned before is that you know, the general overriding law um, you know, in the US and EU may be different, but you can really write a contract that specifies those terms. And that contract then overrides whatever the general law is in the absence of the contract. Um, so when you sign contracts with someone, you may want to go ahead and say, you know, the code I write um, you know, will be, you know, I will retain the copyright to the code I write for you as part of this project. Um, you know, now, people may push back and not be willing to do that, but it's an option, and I know some companies like Larry's uh, actually require that of their clients. They require their clients to give the copyright back to Palantir so the Palantir can then reuse the code or share it with the community. We've had that policy for 15 years now. Palantir owns code that we write for a client and license it to the client. Uh, for the past several years, it's when we've licensed the client under the GPL. Some clients have a hard time swallowing this concept uh, once the, you know, their legal department doesn't get it, but we have been able to convince them that, no, this is not a threat to you. Yes, it's okay. No, you can't own the copyright to all of Drupal. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> not everyone's legal department is fully clued in. <laughs> as a developer, as a consultant, part of your job is to educate your clients on you know, why not just Drupal is right for them, but the GPL is right for them uh, because that is part and parcel of uh, using Drupal. Um, so in addition to actual contracts, um, when you're an employee, when you're a contractor, depending on who you're working with, you may also have non-disclosure agreements. Um, so you should, if you have such an agreement signed, you should look at it because that again may 
um, end up restricting you from distributing code. Um, even though you own the copyright, you may have a non-disclosure agreement and you're, the person you're working with say, may say, no, that's actually confidential information um, and I'm going to sue you if you put it on Drupal.org. So again, you know, if you sign those kind of agreements, think, you know, think a, a little bit about, okay, how does this actually affect code I write? How does this affect you know, my ability to contribute back or release uh, things that aren't really secret, it's just you know, part of this project that I'm working on a client with. Um, another option that I know some uh, shops take, I believe uh, Four Kitchens does, is that they don't ask the copyright to the code but they put a term in their contracts requiring the clients to license back the code to them under the, under the GPL. I mean, it obviously has to be GPL. So the client then ends up with a copyright, which maybe makes their legal department feel better. But because they have then agreed to license <laughs> the code uh, back to Four Kitchens or to you know, whoever the, the shop is, uh, that shop is then free to continue to redistribute that code because it's GPL, it's share alike, they have that freedom. So that's sort of a workaround if, if you, know, you can't um, infor, you know, can't get the copyright assignment. If you can ask um, for the code to be licensed back to you, you effectively have the same end result in terms of your ability to share the code. Um, a final thing is as if you're a developer and you're going out and you're looking you know, sort of in the broader world, you look at GitHub, you look at various you know, code sharing sites, and you see some code you want to use, um, you need to stop and think a little bit about what a license is that code being shared under. Uh, hopefully it has a license statement at all. So GitHub doesn't require people to put a license statement on that code. And you know, that means by default you can't actually use the code. You can read it, but you can't, you can't take it and use it for anything. Um, if code is licensed under something very liberal like the modified BSD, uh, you can combine it freely with GPL code. And that's great. So. Um, if that's sort of why I said at the beginning, if you want something to be used most widely, you want it to be essentially free, uh, the modified BSD is fine because then someone can then take that and combine it with, let's say, Drupal code, and then it will be under the GPL. Uh, but they've at least, you know, they haven't been inhibited uh, from reusing it. Um, it gets a little more uh, complex with some other licenses, like the Apache license is compatible with version 3 of the GPL, but not version 2. Um, so for if, again, if you're doing your own projects, I would recommend sticking with either the GPL or something like the modified BSD. That's a very, very simple license. Okay. Thank you, Peter. So you know, all this is great. This is wonderful. It's a lot of fun rules and legalisms and contract law and, oh boy. So <laughs> what's in it for me? What is it that is, you know, what benefit do you actually get out of Doing, using free software. Aside from it's the only way you're allowed to use Drupal, what benefit is there to you to actually participating in a free software project? You know, what value do you get out of that? And the key question here is there are lots of different ways of defining value. Most people define value in terms of money, but that is not the only way to define, uh, to define value. Vance? Uh, you, know, you can define value in a number of different ways, depending on what your goals are. In an open source project, in, a free so in the free software world, uh, the primary currency is not money, but karma. And we don't mean karma in the you know, hand-wavy, spiritual, you know, rebirth sense. We mean karma in terms of uh, you know, reputation, good deeds, building um, you know, good, good street cred, essentially because that's what leads to a kind of, come on, you know, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours type of environment. Um, you know, good case in point here. When I first got involved in Drupal six years ago, um, I had a hard time getting Drupal installed. And I posted in the forums and, you know, asked a question and some guy answered my question and helped me get Drupal installed. He didn't have to, he didn't get paid for it, but Five years later, six years later, we now have a new, totally awesome database layer in Drupal 7 that can do way more than the old one that he now gets the benefit from and he didn't have to spend a dime on it because you know, me and a team that I led managed to write that instead. Uh, another uh, case in point, um, when my company, Palantir, uh, first started getting involved in Drupal, 
um, we had some trouble with the views module, just figuring out how to do things with it. Everyone knows the views module? I, okay. Um, and so I started talking to Earl Miles, the maintainer, and he spent a fair amount of time walking me through how to do some particularly complex things with views that he had given away for free to us. And, you know, we didn't pay him for that. Uh, I eventually bought him dinner, but you know, he actually you know, didn't make any money off that. What he got, though, was new features added to views that I wrote later on on future projects I did at Palantir. Uh, and then went on and gave several presentations at DrupalCons on using views um, and pushing those kind of architectural changes. So he's getting something back for that time he invested in helping me because then working with the project, I'm then helping him, the database layer, working on views itself, and so forth in that collaborative model. The best way to get what you want is to give other people what they want. This is, and any successful business is built on this concept, as is any successful open source project. <coughs> because, you know, this is how you build up, you, this is how you demonstrate that you are a good person to work with, and that's what you really want. Now, isn't this, you know, you're still giving away what you, what you, the value you bring to the table, your code. Not true. Because, your code is useless. No one hires you for your code. They hire you because you're smart. At Palantir, you know, our intellectual capital is the experience and expertise and problem solving we bring to the table, not code. People don't hire Palantir because of the code we've written. They hire Palantir because of our brains that we've demonstrated b uh, by releasing code and giving it away for free. Because we've demonstrated our expertise in using Drupal, in uh, working with uh, third-party systems and tying those into Drupal and the various other things that we do. Uh, you know, that is what we are demonstrating is our expertise in Drupal. And that's what people pay for. And that kind of participation, demonstrating your expertise, is how you get people's attention. And these days where so many things are dirt cheap, we're, living, we're moving into an attention-based economy as a society in the Western world. <coughs> where you know, attention is measured in time. Time is the currency of attention. And they're not making any more of it. It, it comes at the exact same rate. There's no inflation on time. And getting people's attention gets you new customers. Getting people's attention gets you job opportunities. If you're looking for work, demonstrating that you are a good developer and play nicely with the community helps your resume. Uh, it gets you influence. Let me ask here. Um, Raise your hand if you're actually from the UK, right quick. Because I have your attention right now, I have now compelled you to take an action. That's power. That's the value you get out of participating in open source. Um, you know, because I've contributed so much to the project, I'm now one of the initiative owners for Drupal 8. That gives me an enormous influence into the direction of the project because I've been working with it for so long um, that I've gotten the attention of other developers. That's value. What you, you're building, come on, is your reputation. And reputation in open source is everything. <coughs> uh, reputation is marketing, if you want to be you know, economic about it. Reputation allows you to do things like be selective with your clients. Um, you know, at Palantir, you know, we ha are high enough profile that we can be selective in who we work with. You know, we can say, you know, we don't need to take every client that walks through the door. We can pick and choose. These are the clients we find interesting. This is the work we want to do. These are the clients we want to work with. That matters. That's valuable. And that's something you get by building good reputation in the community. It allows you to be selective in your employees. It's hard to find good Drupal talent. There's a, you know, way more demand for Drupal people than there are Drupal developers. But uh, if you have that kind of reputation, then you're more likely to be able to attract top talent. Whether you're a consultant like Palantir, whether you're a services company like Acquia, whether you are uh, one big site like examiner.com or the New York Times, both of whom run Drupal. <coughs> um, you know, having that kind of reputation, not just of having a big site, but playing nice with the community will attract the kind of people you want to attract. It lets you know your employees beforehand too, because reputation is also your resume. Um, 
I, I, the panel here, I've frequently been in the position of um, hiring new developers. And when we get a resume in for someone, I don't look at the actual resume. The first thing I do is I go to Drupal.org and see what they've done. What modules have they written? Can I look at their code and see if it's good code? What are they like in the issue queues? Are they polite? Are they jerks? Um, do they you know, work on a whole bunch of modules with, modules with a state of one little area? What's their expertise in a given area? Are they helping people out in the forums? What are they like in IRC? You know, these are the kind of things that you can build by working in an open source project. This gets you clients. This gets you hired. <coughs> should skip ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for a time reason, let's skip this. This worked out really well for Palantir back at DrupalCon San Francisco. We hired a whole bunch of new people because we had our pick of really good candidates. <coughs> Come on. This is also a business philosophy. Free software is a business philosophy, not just a software philosophy that is based in trust. <coughs> and by trust, I mean you know, it's just the basis of how you do business. When you're dealing with proprietary software, you're dealing with fear. You're dealing with the fear that your client is going to go elsewhere. You're dealing with the fear that the consultant you're working with is going to stab you in the back. You're dealing with the fear that someone else is going to come along and do something better than you can, and you won't be able to compete. You're dealing with fear that you're not good enough to, to compete in the market. Well, as I was going to say, and uh, proprietary companies also use fear mm -hmm. um, against open source, and particularly even against Drupal. And you'll see this in the broader world and should be aware of it, that people say, well, buy our product. It is uh, more secure because it's commercial. It is more secure. It has less bugs. Um, it goes faster. Yeah. All well, I can't things. see your code. How do I trust you that it's actually more secure? Right. So you can't <laughs> see the code. Right. You don't know. You don't know how many bugs there are, how secure it is. Um, but, but big software vendors will use this argument. Um, and uh, you know, sort of this trust model is, mm -hmm. is your defense against that. Because free software is, at the end of the day, based on trust. Trust that you know, your client is not going to go elsewhere because you're good enough. Trust that your reputation is good enough that it'll get you new clients. Trust that when you're working with the rest of the community, you will get back as much as you put in. Um, it's based on you know, trusting in the community review process, that lots of eyes working on code is going to make better code. Uh, a great quote from Chris DeBana uh, from Google at DrupalCon Boston several years ago. Um, Popular open source software tends to be secure because insecure open source software becomes unpopular fast. <laughs> it's a good line. You know, with, with free software, you're trusting in yourself, in your clients, and in your community. And personally, I am more comfortable working in an environment and a culture that is based on trust than on fear, as both a, both a business and as a uh, society. I think that trust model also helps you make business pitches mm -hmm. so because you can go to a client and say, you can go to anyone else with this project if I'm not good enough. You know, that I'm, I'm going to satisfy you, but you're not locked in by choosing Drupal. Um, you have the freedom to choose any, you know, these hundred mm -hmm. consulting firms uh, to finish the project if it doesn't work out between you and me. And that, that pitch of trust me because you're not locked in, mm -hmm. um, I think helps uh, win business if you can use it effectively. And that doesn't mean you're, that clients are going to wander off on a regular basis. It means that they can sleep at night knowing that they're not wholly dependent on this one developer or on this one company and vice versa. And that builds a trusting relationship between you and your client or you and your vendor where you're working together rather than one of you having the other by the balls. And that's just a better environment to be in. Um, side note. so. Uh uh, tomorrow afternoon, there's a session called Having an Open Relationship with <laughs> Software. Is that right? Uh, so, <laughs> which Jacob is presenting. So, if uh, <laughs> he's going to focus even a little bit more on the business aspects of this, how, how to make money, how to run a business in an open source uh, project. So that's part two. Yeah, so, I think it's kind of like the end of this last part of your session, but expand it to more about practical ways you can talk to your customers about open source 
have a contribution to be a part of your development process. As a developer, how you can contribute and deliver the project on time and implement it yourself. So those are more practical techniques around it. So for the recording, that's practical techniques for engaging. Um, obviously, people watching the recording, it's not going to help you much. <laughs> but everyone in the room, I do encourage you to go to that session. So we've got about uh, 10 minutes, so questions. The um, copyright assignment, uh, is it important to add that into your actual code files? I've seen it in some modules where somebody says copyright, such and such name at the top of the file. So for repeat, Drupal. Repeat the question. Uh, I'm sorry, you're right. Uh, the question is uh, marking code files as, as what the licensing terms are them are, are on them. For Drupal, what we recommend is don't put that in the code file because when you package you know, when the system packages a tarball um, or a, a targz file or a .zip file, it adds a license.txt file that is a copy of GPL version two, and it says you know this applies to this module. But the, but the copyright statement, I mean Drupal core mm -hmm. itself has a separate file. True saying all this code is copyright. I, I, so I think that... Are you asking about the license or the copyright ownership? The, copy. the, the copyright. Some people have their modules in mm -hmm. the doc block will do copyright and then their name. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's okay. The caveat is if you're getting lots of patches from different people, then unless you're having them sign some kind of agreement, um, there's lots of people who own copyright. There are probably around 2,000 people who hold copyright on various pieces of Drupal core. Um, and tracking that, you know, this function, this line, and so forth, is copyright this person, is very impractical. Um, in a project like Drupal, I'd recommend having a major contributors list. That is, these are people who have done large work on the system. They may have been maintainers at some point. But you don't say, these are all the people who hold copyright. It's, these are the major contributors, all of whom are going to also hold copyright. But that's not, you're, saying it, you're not saying it's an exclusive list. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it might be easier just to have that set one separate file also if you have 20 code files, right? If you get a new major contributor, you don't necessarily want to have to have to remember to update every single code file. One text file is probably sufficient. I mean, we really haven't had challenges, mm -hmm. but it's, it's useful just to at least note who the major contributors are. Now, if, if it's code that you're not putting on Drupal.org and you just, you know, custom module for your client you've given to your client, I would put a, a doc block on there saying copyright my company license under the GPL. There's a standard header that uh, the GPL suggests you use. So if you're not distributing it on Drupal.org, I would recommend doing that. Other questions? All the way in the back. Not and so the question is uh, license compatibility. You know what, what does that mean essentially? Um, for example, the Apache two license uh, says, in essence, here's the code. Do what you want. Have fun. But if you have any patents, software patents that apply to this code, and you sue someone uh, over those software uh, patents, you lose any license to use this code that other people own. So like if you if I hold a software patent and I, um, you know, add some code to the Apache web server, and that gets distributed, and then I go and sue Sony, who's using Apache, over that software patent, then I lose the right to use Apache at all from the various other people who have written uh, code for the Apache server. Um, that's kind of their mutual def uh, mutual assured destruction kind of approach to uh, software patents. Um, so that, that's incompatible with GPL version 2 because that's an additional requirement. And part of the GPL is you may not add additional requirements and restrictions to the code. It's, you, know, you must share alike, and you cannot add any new restrictions like you, know, you can't say you can't use this for government or you can't use this for some political party or whatever. That's an extra restriction. GPL version 3 has essentially the same patent defense clause in it. So you're not adding a new restriction by mixing Apache 2 and GPL 3 code. So that's OK. So that's what we mean by compatible. Um, it mostly applies to the GPL family of licenses because of the you cannot add any restrictions clause. Uh, so that's, does that answer your question? And if, yeah, if you go to the 
the GPL site, they actually have a long list. I mean, there's many, many licenses. Mm -hmm. You can go to open source. Uh, dot org, or you can go to the, the GPL site and they list, you know, there's 50 different licenses. But, you know, there's really, you know, don't pick a random license. Pick one of these, like, basically three licenses that I picked up here because they're really well understood how they work and how they interact with each other. Um, but if you, if you find some project license under something, you can go there, especially the GPL site, and it'll tell you, yes, you can combine this with the GPL because it doesn't have any other restrictions, or no, it has some strange clause. Um, the important thing to note is that it's always okay for you to use both of those together. Um, the restriction on combining is basically uh, distributing to other people a combined software that uses both of that. And giving the code to your client at the end of a project may or may not count as distributing depending on your contract. So it's generally best to only mix things that would be legal for you to distribute if you're going to. Yeah. The uh, question is, why is Drupal GPL 2 and not 3? When Drupal was started, there was no GPL 3. Um, and at the time, most projects just said GPL and didn't really consider the version. Um, since then, we have clarified that Drupal is GPL 2 and later, so we are GPL 3 compatible. Uh, we really haven't had the discussion of whether or not Drupal should move to GPL 3. Personally, I would like to do so at some point. Not necessarily right now, but I would like to do so at some point. But uh, that you know, there are people who would say the opposite because of things like the the patent protection clause. There are some companies that don't want to deal with GPL three at all. That we may scare off, and that that conversation just hasn't happened. Um, you know, my own personal feeling is, if they're going to get scared off, scared off by that, then I don't want them. But I, I freely understand that I'm not uh, necessarily the only opinion there. <laughs> Uh, can, you can release a Drupal module under GPL3, but you cannot upload it to Drupal.org unless it is GPL2 and later. Um, right now, you cannot put anything on Drupal.org software-wise unless it is GPL2 and later, the same license as Drupal Core. Were we to switch to GPL3 at some point, that would be a blanket statement across everything, and so all contrib modules and Core itself would all just, as they come off Drupal.org, uh, would go up to GPL3 at the same time. But again, there's no immediate plans to do so. Good question over here. Uh, it's a teensy nitpicky thing uh, about what you said, uh, the uh, new uh, kernel at the beginning. Just according to what I've read recently, uh, there's actually a plan to release a new uh, kernel for non Debian at the, uh, the end of 2012. So the point is that the new project may actually have a working kernel now. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I heard Debian was talking about doing a, a herd-based version at some point. I never actually saw it in the wild. They're saying uh, end of 2012 now. They said they for Wheezy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we may or may not have a working GNU herd kernel at some point in the near future. Uh, you heard it here first. <laughs> Other questions? I think we have time for one, maybe two more. Uh, like one more minute, yeah. I guess not. All right. Okay. Thank you all for coming. Yeah, and enjoy you. the rest of the conference. <laughs>